Elbowitz High School, 1942 State Class B champion. I think the Elbowitz team was a team that was about 20 or 30 years ahead of its time. Because Apple Woods is a really tight-knit community and it, it was like Camelot. It could have been a dynasty for so many things and it was just taken away with the building of the Garrison Dam. In a way, it's kind of a haunted landscape, the very radical change that has occurred in that landscape. It's just a whole lot different than it was. Funding for Basketball, Water, and the Lost City of Elbow Woods is made possible by the three affiliated tribes, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nations, celebrating our tradition of resilience, strength, and power, and by the members of Prairie Public. He was very proud of the story that took place. And at that young age, he was very proud that they made it to state as Native Americans and that the ball playing was very top notch. If memory serves me right, it was like 15 cents or something to get in the game. Well, we were poor, didn't have 15 cents. I wanted to get in. I found a bathroom window partially open. I climbed through the bathroom window and got myself a spot to watch them. And the first thing I remember, they seemed like men really compared to the team that, that beat them. And they were good, they were good athletes. My biggest memory of the game, they could run forever. The story of the 1941-42 Elbow Woods North Dakota High School basketball team begins in the fall of 1941, prior to America's involvement in World War II. Their story might now be largely forgotten, except for a bizarre twist in the 1942 state championship game, coupled with the tragic aspect of what eventually happened to this small town on the Fort Berthold Reservation. The story you're about to see is one of loss and victory and 60 years of struggle and perseverance. A time when people believed in honesty, a time when perhaps people showed their feelings less freely, but felt them no less deeply. The town was named Elbow Woods, which uh, makes a lot of sense. It's a very a visual th thing, an elbow in the woods. And the Missouri River at, in that location flowed southward from like what's now Williston. So the Missouri River was f flowing southward and then it makes that bend and goes eastward. And in that, in that bend of the river then is where the community of Elbow Woods was established. The population probably would have been maybe 200. Well, the town of Elbow Woods really, I think the best classification would be an Indian agency was there, and that was sort of the hub. And uh, But it was not incorporated as such in that we did not have a mayor or, or a city council or anything like that. It was totally government. My father lost uh, his parents at a very, very early age, and as a young boy, he, among other things, herded horses on the reservation. He went up to the Indian reservation and got a job, and he, from that he loved horses all of his life. But in, in the process of doing that, later in life, he said to me, I want to take you back up to see the friends I have on the Indian reservation. And we drove uh, to the Fort Berthold Reservation, and uh, we drove into Elbow Woods, North Dakota. And I, I have memories of it as a young boy driving into this little town about the same size as my hometown of Regent, North Dakota, several hundred people. It was quiet, pretty little community. We were the first farmers of North Dakota. Squash, corn, beans, watermelon, a number of crops, and we grew them and the fertile bottomlands. 
I've seen pictures of uh, Elba Woods, but I know they had a clinic, they had a main street, they had stores, and our 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 grandparents lived around the surrounding area of Elba Woods. They, they didn't have diabetes. They, 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 they everything was there, like coal to heat their house, and they grew their own gardens. They hunted deer; was plentiful. You know, things were good. The economy was good. People were happy. You know and uh, people were lawful, you know. To me, it was like heaven. Leon Wall, I think, uh, deserves uh, just a, a lot of attention because here's a young man, 27 years old, but they came to Elba Woods from Washington, D.C., although he was a native Oklahoman. And he comes into Elba Woods to the agency headquarters and reports in because he's a federal employee now and he's going to teach what he thought was math and science. And so when he and his wife arrive there, the principal says, okay, yep, you are, you are our teacher. I think school had already started. It was probably September by the time he got here. School started early September. And... Um, so he said, well, not only will you teach math and science, but you're also going to be the coach for our, our athletic team. And although he was only 27 years old, he was able to combine, you know, all of these skills of these nine players that he had. And he soon recognized that, you know, they possessed some unusual qualities. There's something special about these guys, you know. We were to live in one of the new dormitories. We were conducted to our apartment, which was as nice as could be found in the Waldorf Astoria, we said. There was one exception. All cooking was to be done in the student kitchen. Our meals were to be taken with the students. In fact, we were to conduct the dormitory as though we were the mother and father, and the students were the children, in a home of 20 children. You get this young man and his wife going way out to a little tiny reservation, coming from the East Coast, and saying, they're going to make a difference out there and teach and work with Indian children. And the coach brought some new ideas about how that game should be played. Many odds against them. N no money. A little tiny gym to practice in. Very little support from the community because the community could not go to these games. I mean, it, those were during World War II years. People just couldn't travel. Very few people even had a car. Leon Wall began coaching the Warriors right away. He would later comment that the Elba Woods gym was so small, the free throw circle intersected the retaining circle at center of court. The only room for fans was on the stage or a small strip less than one yard wide around the edge of the gym. Camaraderie, there's a lot. They played as a team. And I looked over the stats and numbers. Sidney, although he was a freshman, my dad's younger brother, was obviously, uh, arguably, somebody would say, but I, I, I will say this, probably had the most talent. So my dad was the captain of the team, the leader being a senior. The other uh, two players of, of great note was Mr. Charlie Blake. And Harry Grady, I see the stats where he had some games and he scored a lot of baskets. But the one that really stood out uh, was considered very, very good and great basketball player was Johnny Rabbithead. Those Indians just about turned the gym inside out, with Isaac Fox and Johnny Rabbithead holding the ball in one hand and waving it in front of a trooper's face, daring him to try to take it away. With Sidney Fox's one-handed hook shots while fading away from the basket, Charlie Blake's work on rebounds and dribbling, and the all-around passing and shooting of the team as a whole, it was a show. Oh, I know that he, he played, he was one of the guards or forwards, and he said, uh, you, know, you know what, I scored 10 points in that game. I said, oh, did you? And at the time, I, I didn't think it was a big deal until I started going to basketball tournaments, and I, I started coaching at different schools throughout the state. Back in those days, the floor of the gyms, you know, with these, with what they had uh, at the time, and I guess you might as well say Cracker Jack box, uh, 
floor. But my dad, he had, a, I guess, a good shot, a famous shot, so they called him Johnny after Radiator. <laughs> so he, he would, uh, you know, jump up in one motion, jump off the radiator and shoot it all in one motion. And that was his signature shot. So he was uh, pretty famous for that shot back in the days for the Warriors. My uncle told me about that. They were, they were fast, you know. They had a couple of tall players, you know, but they were faster than the other teams. And my uncle uh, in his high school, he was a 100 yard dash champ too from McLean County, you know. So uh, he was he was real fast you know, at the time. So they, all the guys, they had a real fast uh, moving team. Uh, he was um, center and forward. And he played uh, mostly the forward, I believe. And um, uh, this, this was uh, before right before World War II. So there was quite a uh, bit of stir going on and the Elmwoods Warriors at that time in the state of North Dakota was one of those uh, big events going on for a championship game. Sydney, uh, Sydney was well built. Sydney, Sydney had a really a good perspective of the game. Some people are just physical. He had them both, physical and mental. And uh, I thought he was one of the best high school players I'd seen at that time. He was one of the younger players on the team. When they went to state in 1941-42, he was a freshman. He was definitely a role player, but they needed all nine players. He was the sixth man on the team. He was a sophomore in high school, and it was interesting some of the stories that he would tell me that he had a nickname they called him Turkey. And the reason they called him Turkey was because his hands were so big. He could palm a ball in each hand and hold it. The coach nicknamed him Turkey because of that. He had a lot of good memories of being able to come in and fill in as a substitute player and all of the playing time that he received. The appearance of the team when they came on the floor, did you notice how they fairly shine? The way Charlie Blake smiles when they call a foul on him, the way Isaac Fox agreed with the referee when they called a close one on him. The way the entire team was ready to help an opponent who fell down. The condition of the team, the way they'd keep moving while the other team was getting a minute's rest. We like to think of the Warriors as our team also. As the season went on, townspeople and fans in the area realized the team was special. Losing only two games along the way, they not only qualified for the state tournament for the first time in Elbowwood's history, but sports writers began to write about them in folk hero terms. By this time, the Warriors were well known in the area and had begun to attract a fan club. They were the stuff dream teams are made of. The name that was given to them was Dazzling Indian Quint. The media started calling them this dazzling Indian Quint because they're dazzling, they're Indian, and there's five on the floor and they're doing some amazing things. You combine that with a small gymnasium where a radiator sticks out on the floor, and you know, it's just a fast evolution of basketball for Elba Woods. They had inferior equipment. They were not equipped in the football or basketball or anything like the rest of the schools, particularly the sneakers. Tattered sneakers, but they won. I remember the one guy passed like, like he's going to be a softball. He'd go behind his back and then left-handed. They just, they loved the game. They were flashy, and they were the Harlem Globetrotters kind of, but I never, there was a sharing of the ball, and I think that came from that tribal culture. You're talking about the sportsmanship. They follow somebody, they'd raise a hand, they'd pick up somebody from the floor. A lot of ball handling was done, and it wasn't, extremely fancy as you see today, but it was a lot of um, uh, freestyle type uh, basketball. There was between the legs, bouncing the ball, passing, wasn't out of control or anything, but they were uh, unexpected passes that they received, and that's how they scored some of their points uh, on the big teams that they played. And in perhaps another area where the team was ahead of its time, the nine-player team consisting of seven native players and two white players never experienced any racial strife. I think what this team did 
and becoming the first Native American team to play in a state championship is it went so far to show others, other Native Americans, other non-Native people in the state and everywhere else that there's some acceptability that these walls of racism or walls of, of misunderstanding or prejudice don't need to be there. Occasionally we did visit about that and say, hey dad, you know, you were kind of a minority living on that reservation. And he said, yeah, he says, we were one of a few white families. And he said, so he says, there would have been some reverse discrimination, but he said he never ever felt looked down he never felt that he was snubbed by the natives in any way, shape, or form. In fact, we had great trust in them, and they had trust in us. We never locked our doors. They never locked our doors. We were never concerned about anybody breaking in in any way, shape, or form. He had a tremendous amount of respect for the people that he lived with and worked with. The people were always welcoming. In the first game of the tournament on Thursday, March 19th, Elbowoods barely nosed out the New England Tigers, 29 to 27. On Friday, the Warriors squeaked past Sacred Heart Academy of Fargo, 29 to 28. Fouled with only 17 seconds remaining, Sidney Fox stepped up and sank the gift shot that won, 29 28. In eight tries from the foul line during the game, Sidney Fox made good seven last night, to these, he added seven field goals for a total of 21 points. On Saturday, they met the Lakota Raiders for the title game. The gym at Minot High was packed to the rafters with basketball fans, many of them rooting for the Warriors. A sports writer of the time commented that even if offered new tires, no one would give up their seat. But on the day of the state title game against Lakota, Coach Leon Wall faced a dilemma. So happened to be the day of the championship game that he did turn 20 and he, he did um, abide by the North Dakota High School Activities Association rules, eligibility rules, and, and sat, you know, sat out the game. In his memoirs, Coach Wall wrote that well before the state tournament, I received two calls from the North Dakota High School Athletics Association, calling this, John's age that is, to my attention. I informed them that I knew about his age and the rule that made Johnny ineligible and that we did not plan on using him. This was a blow to our team as it left us with only two substitutes since eight was a traveling squad. So the coach said, you know, we're a team of integrity and honesty, and uh, as much as it's going to hurt us, uh, we cannot play Johnny Rabbithead. So he was not allowed to play in the championship game. And in that championship game, um, one of the Fox brothers fouled out, and it was just a matter of one or two points going to the free throw line and making that free throw. And Alba Woods had led the entire way except for the last minute and 30 seconds, I believe. So that was a change that changed the outcome of the game. And my uncle Sidney would say this forever until the day he died. If Johnny had been allowed to play on championship night, they could have played all their players and the two refs and there's no way they were going to beat us. And they ended up beating Alba Woods by one point with Sidney fouled out. My dad with a severely sprained ankle and no Johnny Rabbit head. There's three of your top players, and we lose by one point in the final minute of the championship game. Led the whole game and lost in the last minute by a free throw, one point. Sidney Fox wrote a letter to the editor of the McLean County Independent, which read as follows. Dear Mr. Daly, we appreciate your backing us in the state tournament. We tried our best all the way through the tournament. We are happy to get second place. It's almost as good as first. So they, so they lost the game by one point. And the thing that's really, I think, remarkable about it is there were no hard feelings. In fact, Sidney Fox said, 
Well, we are just delighted to, to come back with second place trophy. I mean, they were totally happy with the second place. But the one point loss in the title game would not be the end of things. Several months later, Coach Wall received a letter from the Lakota superintendent stating that Lakota starter Orlin Billings was 20 years old at the time of the championship game and had actually played the whole season as a 20-year-old, meaning they had to forfeit the state championship and their entire season for using an ineligible player. And so the high school sports association commended the school for having been timely and forthright. And of course, it made a difficult decision for everybody to say, okay, now what do we do next? Immediately after that, it was actually awarded to Elba Woods and said, well, Elba Woods deserves and they will be the champion at that point in time. Now, depending on who you talk to, some complaints came forward in particular about some of the teams that lost to Lakota in the semis and the first night. And their argument, I understand, was being made that why are you making Elba Woods champions when we lost close ones to the same team that used an ineligible player as well? One team out of deliberation follows the rules. The other, and, and I don't know what the basis is, if it was ignorance or our choice, free will, uh, the other team chooses to play a person that is 20 years old and hence the controversy. They did a good job and they were not sure. I mean, there was no hard feelings, I don't think. But you know what I mean? They sort of took it with a grain of salt and figured, well, they did well. But if it got taken away, it got taken away. And even though given to Alba Woods a year later after the tournament, they made a decision to take the trophy and the title away and make a declaration that there would be no champion in 1942. It was kind of a way of avoiding having to make a decision. It, it does only seem fair in retrospect that a, a team that had fought their way through the other side of the bracket and won all of their games by slim margins competitively wouldn't automatically receive consideration as a default champion. I remember getting those booklets, and I knew the truth because my, my dad, because of people telling me what happened in 42. But we, you'd open up that Class B booklet, and you'd go down and see who won championships since the beginning, and you'd see that 1942, and there'd be a notation in there saying, no championship. And you know what? It's easy to look at it that way, but a lot of people, and seeing that, would say, well, World War II you know, bombing of Pearl Harbor and, and December 7th, 1941. You know, we got into World War II, there must not, you know, had any basketball team and no season and it must have been interrupted and, and things changed and no tournament and we were at war. And well, that's not the truth. It just creates a misperception in the public's eyes if they see that 1942 no championship awarded. Everyone, I think, has assumed for years that that meant that the, it was because of the war, that there was not a championship played. And that, that's almost more of a disservice to the players on both sides of the bracket, the second and third and fourth place teams and so forth, to sort of deny that what they did was really pretty significant. You have nine players on that team. The seven tribal members, recognized tribal members on that team, every single one of them became veterans of World War II. And I think that's something that in discussing Elba Wood's 1942 team, that should never be forgotten. And you think of the coach that Elba Wood had, Coach Wall, he made the decision not to play his best player because of the rules. So he was ethically really strong and he was morally strong and he, was, he had really excellent character. And he also taught the young men of that basketball team what it means to follow the rules and be fair. And I think one of the things that came into play is because it was a Native American team and it was the first Native American team to win the championship in North Dakota. So then, you know, they should have been declared as soon as it was recognized that there was an eligible player.
as Elbow Woods continued to thrive through the 1940s with more talented basketball teams returning to the state tournament, a ticking time bomb signaled an end to a way of life. Behind this sign lies a story, the story of the greatest land and water development in the world, a story of the role this tremendous dam will play in the overall taming of the Missouri River. It is a big job. An earthen dam being built across the Missouri on the Big Bend where it turns south toward Bismarck and Mandan. Garrison Dam will be the largest rolled fill earth embankment in the world with the main purposes of providing flood control, hydroelectric power, irrigation, and recreation. The straw that broke the camel's back was the Garrison Dam. But let's go down to the job for a closer look. To build big dams, you need big contractors, and this is no exception. The pleasant 1950s narration about the building of the Garrison Dam, which in turn created Lake Sakakawea, belies the impact and ruin which came because of it. Elbow Woods was in the direct path of the project and would have to be flooded out. Well, Pick Sloan was a big plan by big thinkers. Uh, the Missouri River would often flood, no question about it. The water comes rushing out of the mountains, and if they have too much water, it comes rushing down through the Missouri and the tributaries and so on and overflows its banks. And, you know, it, it, whether it's Mandan and Bismarck or, or, you know, virtually everywhere, including on the reservation, you, you would see flooding. And through the big communities up and down the Missouri, they decided, we, we want to try to control flooding. We want to, what we want to do is build a series of main stem dams along the Missouri River that will be able to keep water when we don't have enough and then use it through the storage or uh, to try to uh, retain water when we have too much and try to overcome some of the serious flooding problems on the Missouri. The Native Americans bore the brunt. They, they were required to bear the cost, but they had precious few benefits from it. And frankly, among other things, you know, they, that garrison dam and diversion project, it flooded the river bottom lands where the best berries and, and fruits and crops were able to be planted and grown and produced. And so the Native Americans had to move to the highlands, a vastly different environment, different diet and so on. So it, it imposed significant amounts of costs on the Native Americans who lived there. Because we had crops, we were self-sustaining. We were able to not depend on the federal government. We were, we were able to grow our own crops, raise our own cattle, you know, eat our own food, live humbly, but very well. The Pixlone program that created a series of dams to be built along the Missouri River for a number of purposes, primary for, you know, generating electricity. They claim flood control, but we've all realized that that plan don't always work so well and when it comes to flooding. They did it for a number of reasons, recreation and other things, so they justified it. Almost every Sunday in summer after the dam was closed, we would drive down a uh, half an hour drive, maybe a little bit more, to watch the water come up in places that he remembered. When the water got to Elbow Woods, it was a place that he very much wanted to see and to remember he'd, he'd spent time there as a boy and as a young man and, and really even as an adult and the father of my older siblings. So um, we would drive down most Sunday afternoons and uh, essentially watch the water creep into the town. It took almost a year uh, before the water actually got to Elbow Woods and then it didn't, it didn't rise all of a sudden. It wasn't you know, it was, it was a slow flood. So you could live comfortably in the town uh, while there was water coming up in the streets and the low places. And so people didn't leave until they had to. And I think there was a sense that what they were going to was nowhere nearly as good as what Elba Woods was. It, w it was difficult for my, my, uh, my grandparents who raised me. Uh, we had this, we stayed down, Elba Woods kind of on the, not on the hill, but on the flat. And then there was a little layer here where we had a lot of log houses around, you know. And uh, that last year in the spring, the water start coming up. So, and people start moving, moving out higher up the other, their land and stuff like that, you know. And 
we had uh, we had stayed there until uh, there was a there was a little house up in Elbows behind a grocery store. We moved from there into that house. It was not as pronounced to me then as after I met people in the Indian community from there later on in life. And here are the pain and the anguish and the fear and how the con job they got, what they were supposed to get, they didn't get. I remember driving when the water was coming up. I can remember seeing that and thought, where are they gonna go? What are they gonna do? How are they gonna, are they gonna be in tent cities or what? And how would we feel if all of a sudden they're coming and flooding our homes? And as you mentioned, the project's never finished. How many millions or billions did that cost? Our family had pigs, they had um, livestock, they had chickens. And one way we found out of when they moved, the allotment movement, we have a receipt of everything that was moved of our grandparents and the government paid them to move. So when our dad went to college in 1950, 51 and played football, he came back to help the move. And when you think about that and all those young athletes, when they played at Alba Woods, it was a dynasty for basketball. And they went to the state tournament, I believe six times out of the 17 years they were there. And then they get drafted and they go off to war and they come back. And they come back to where their land is being taken away. Their homes are being taken away. Their livelihood is being taken from them. And it must have been a feeling of betrayal. Dad always insisted it was the best farmland in North Dakota and uh, he wasn't exempting the Red River Valley. You know, I don't know that that would be scientifically the case, but uh, yes, it was, it was good farmland. And of course, the tribes can speak for themselves, but you know, these were agricultural people. They, they, they knew about growing stuff. The, the agricultural base was taken away. It shattered familiarity, and that's basically what uh, human nature is about. And uh, when you leave something, there's emotions that are involved. There's the process of facing up to it or denying it. It's painful. Or you go and then you face yourself individually, and I'm sure all of them did individually. And um, it was a new beginning, but yet the, the familiarity of the lifestyle and the culture was uh, being given up. So it was an unknown journey to begin with. And uh, a lot of people were affected by that psychologically. There are no shortcuts to healing. There's just um, the process of going through the hurt, the recognition of it, the digesting of what takes place, and then trying to uh, put it in its proper place in your lifetime. So that's kind of like what took place with the Garrison Dam. He had some, Dad had some heartbreak over that because his home was gone. I remember him telling me going back there to an Elba Woods reunion and a family reunion and they got out on a boat and they went over the top of Lake Sakakawea there and found where the homestead where Elba Woods was and, and he says you could look down there the water was clear and he says you could see some of the town landmarks. So I look at the Southwest Water Pipeline Project, I look at the Northwest Area Water Supply Project, I look at the Western Area Water Supply Project, that is what has really kept people in these rural areas. So from that perspective, it was good. From the perspective of the fact that the best bottom land in the world, and I might be probably embellishing it when I say in the world, but that's now underwater, never to be used in the cultivation state so that we can produce food for the world. You lose not only your homes, you lose not only your ability to raise crops, you, you lose not only a school system that was now thriving, that had a great reputation and, and was on the map, as my uncle would say. But if you think about it, where you have to go and dig up your relatives, those that you can get to, and, and, and rebury them, on high grounds, the emotional and spiritual impacts to our people was very devastating.
Garrison Dam will make the Big Muddy really settle down and go to work. It's all a part of the big job. By 1953, the dam was ready to be dedicated and families had been relocated. And a new town, called ironically Newtown, was built as a new center of the reservation and a town where former Elbowwoods area residents could settle. To be honest with you, as a leader of our nation, we've been in a recovery mode ever since that time. And we've been trying to build out of what was done to us beyond our control what was done to us beyond our choice. We didn't agree to it. We didn't want it. Uh, there was at that time politically uh, a, a conflict of factions that said, one said, keep fighting. The other said, we're not going to win. Let's make hay of what we can get and try to survive through this. And it was very uh, controversial and, and very uh, intense time to accept this happening. I was in the last graduating class out of Elb Woods. I was 16 when I graduated. And the year that President Eisenhower came to close the gates and officially declare the Garrison Dam operational was on June 11, 1953, the uh, day that I turned 17. So that's how I remember that date so well. And in fact, uh, a delegation from Elb Woods of veterans went to meet President Eisenhower because he was a World War II hero. He helped win the war. It made sense in the context of the time. Uh, it does not make sense in the context of today. It would, you know, if that, if, if such a thing were proposed today, it wouldn't happen. But partly it's because this did happen and it didn't work. The whole, the whole garrison diversion dream turned out not to be viable. The Rolled Earth Dam under construction near Garrison, North Dakota is one of the key structures of the Pick Sloan plan of 105 dams. Well, the Garrison Diversion Plan was uh, a plan that was part of that big Pick Sloan plan. On this main stem dam, the Garrison Dam, the issue was a diversion, and the diversion was for irrigation, but also to divert water when there was too much and keep it and store it when there was too little and control flooding. So I, I think it's safe to say uh, the benefits from it were real in terms of uh, helping resolve the flooding from this untamed river. Uh, that's one thing. Second, uh, the money that the state received in order to build water projects all across the state, rural water projects, that, that money came from money that I and others put in the appropriations process in order to just, just force the federal government to live up to its promise because we didn't get the one plus million acres of irrigation. That just didn't happen. Why wasn't it finished? Why wasn't it completed as promised? A very big water project like that becomes controversial in Congress. The environmentalists uh, became very, very upset about something called the Lone Tree Reservoir, which kind of became the hood ornament uh, on this project. And so the issue of moving water from the Missouri to the Red when it was necessary, if the red would run dry, that didn't happen. The irrigation that was promised, that didn't happen. I encourage all North Dakotans and, and visitors that come to North Dakota, really look deep into that history of that lake. As beautiful as it is, and, and the scenery, and the recreation that goes in and out of that, that lake, there is a, a deeper, deeper story. You know, there's a deep spirit within that lake. Was garrison diversion successful? In part because it succeeded in taming that river where you'd, we didn't have these unbelievable floods uh, that came and visited our state for some time. But uh, much of it that was promised uh, was not something that was experienced by our state. The costs, however, were experienced by Native Americans living on the three affiliated tribes reservation. You've seen the picture of the of the tribal council and the, the 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 weeping. I think that speaks pretty powerfully. In the years after Garrison Dam was built, the memories of the little town underneath Lake Sakakawea began to fade. But there was still one more piece of business left unfinished the 1942 title, and who it really belonged to. The State Class B uh, program, that program, if you look in the back, it would say, uh, it'd have a question mark in 1942. 
In the 1990s, my uncle Sidney was really heavily involved. I myself was in college. I came back and I got really busy with my career. So it was mainly Sydney, and he was going about and doing interviews and he had asked the, the high school board, you know, talk to media. He had gone to look for the trophy. He, 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 it really became his drive to right this wrong. And unfortunately, when he passed away in 1999, his his life ended without achieving his dream, which was which was to bring that title back, rightfully back to Elba Woods. It affected so many different pieces that they were scared to open it up. And where would you start, and where would you stop? I think that was the the biggest thing that the board was dealing with. But when they started, when they focused on that game, then I believe they did the right thing. I think initially I met Mark Fox at a at one of the tournaments, and then if I remember correctly, he came to my office, and where we started discussing the real detail of this, and uh, basically, it was my responsibility to set the agenda, and uh, I know it had been brought up before and it had been denied. I think more than once actually, and. And, uh, you know, but Mark made just a fantastic presentation and, and he had legitimate uh, statements that were made and, and he basically convinced me in the office at that time that it, it's the right thing to do. Around 2001, um, I began to reach out. I began to talk to people. I even talked to a couple board members. Uh, on the board and said, you know, what do you think about this? And and that's when the invite came and said, well, get your documentation together. You're more than welcome to present to the High School Activities Association. And that was in January 2002. And myself, along with uh, a friend and also um, a fellow council member, uh, Austin Gillette, we went to the High School Activities Association board and we made the plea. Yeah, I think probably the most compelling was if it happened today, what would you do? And that was a pretty challenging question. And our bylaws answered that. Even though they probably weren't in place then, they could be applied. And that's what the board chose to do. And so I placed him on a future agenda. And then he came to the board meeting and represented Elbow Woods. He represented them very well. It took almost 60 years, but Elbow Woods is finally getting some respect in the record books. The North Dakota High School Activities Association approved a motion recognizing Elbow Woods as the 1942 state Class B basketball champion at its Saturday meeting ending nearly six decades of waiting by the squad. The standard today is to recognize the runner-up team, and that's what should be done here, said Mark Fox from the affiliated Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara tribes. The decision was made a long time ago to declare no champion, and that just doesn't seem right to me. Of course, it wasn't unanimous. There was two or three that said, disagree and keep it that way. I want to overturn something that was done a long time ago. And um, they had their reason, I presume. But uh, the majority said, yes, it's come time. And Sherm Selling was, uh, became a very good friend. Sherm was the executive director, of course, of the association at that time. And he, he was really a strong advocate of saying, we need resolve here, this is really important. It's important to the state of North Dakota. It's important to your tribal members. It's important to a lot of people. It's important to Class B basketball that they, they, they do this right. And I, I've, we've all been so appreciative of Sherm. You know, I, I think it meant the world to him. Uh, uh, very proud people, and they were denied as a result of a rule violation. And 
I can only imagine, if I was the recipient of that, how I would feel, and they were elated. Ladies and gentlemen, the North Dakota High School Activities Association has recently declared that the Elbows High School basketball team will be officially recognized as the 1942 State Class B champions. And those original Elbow Woods Warrior Team members or their representatives are with us tonight. And at this time, we'd like to acknowledge them. We have Leon Fox, represented by Gerald Fox. Dwayne Charging, represented by Steve Charging. Harry Grady, represented by Arnold Grady. John Rabbithead, represented by Delvin Rabbithead. Charles Blake, represented by Gordon Blake. Sidney Fox, represented by Lauren Fox. Isaac Ike Fox, represented by Mark Fox. The two living members of that team are also with us tonight. They are Ray Wycom and Harold Oderman. When, when he got the call that they were going to be awarded the title, that was especially uplifting to him because he says, you know, we worked on this for 60 years and we finally get the title. He, and he says, I'm a member of a state championship team. There was a lot of excitement for him. And then, of course, Mark Fox and the three affiliated tribes put together an outstanding recognition and celebration for this event. For me, it was really kind of sad in a way because most of the people that the players, the young athletes had actually passed away. And 60 years later, after you win a state championship and you know that you've won it and your community knows, is a long time. It was amazing to hear the crowd in that state tournament in North Dakota. Everybody was cheering in that gym. And so you know that it was finally accepted by the state of North Dakota that they were declared the champions of 1942. Those athletes in, in the 1940s and early 50s had children, and they had children. So he, even though the school's gone, even though everything's flooded out, you see these awesome, awesome, that that same blood of those Elbow Woods players, what we now call the Elbow Woods lore, almost everybody that is an enrolled member can trace themselves back to those amazing athletes at Elbow Woods High School. 40, so, oh, look at that steal. Clean. Now it's a bragging right, you know, to that. And the Elbows was a champion there, and even though they had never won the other years they won, but they still had that championship, 1942, you know. So, and to be a, a have a, a relative on the team was today's, you know, real. I think, good, you know. So we always wish that they could have been here when and known that you know that they were the champions. I think he would have feel feel the a sense of pride and that he you know he accomplished something. My, my dad and Kenny Rutherford, that they would talk about it. And they, they, they said they were honest and well, we should have had that title, but they, they were humble men. What they would talk about, of course, was many issues, but always, always, and a little boy sitting there trying to be nosy and listening, they would always at some point in time talk about and say, whatever happened to what happened to Alba was, did, did they ever get that trophy back? Did they ever acknowledge and recognize that team? And the discussion would be, no, they never did. And then the, the comments would always be, you know, that's just not fair, that's not right. And they would talk that way all the time. And I would listen as a little boy, and I always remember that, and that it meant so much to these elders and these people talking. And, and in my own heart, I knew that, that some way, somehow, that needed to be addressed. All of a sudden, you have an event like this, and it really brings it back to life, you know. And you just feel that spirit, that very strong spirit, you know, of those players in the room, 
um, they were definitely there and just most of all just the uh, the joy you know the, the joy behind that was most powerful that I experienced but boy credit to those guys who who never gave up again what an amazing story call it unfortunate Colin cheated out of um, their title a technicality call it whatever you want to call it but making it right was obviously the the right thing to do and they achieved that my one wish is I would have liked to have seen the championship game and all the other games Elbow Woods played. That would have been so fun. It's like the Elbow Woods team showed us the ability and skill to succeed in sports or in any other area in life we want to pursue. It's similar to what our chairman, Mark Fox, said. We can do what they did. The Elbow Woods team was displaying positive role modeling to us without probably even realizing it at the time. They were giving us hope getting us excited and passionate. We need that to persevere and not to give up. I think it's an important story that is really worth telling and worth telling the whole context of it and the implications of it. It would be a short story. It wouldn't be very interesting for anybody to say, well, you know, it, uh, title was vacated and uh, nobody was champion and, and to realize that uh, you know, good can come of this process, I think, as well, that uh, all of these people have a right to be proud of their contributions, their achievements, the things that they did with their lives, and how that reflects on the families and the communities that they come from. It was a sense of achievement, you know, for everyone. So students need to understand that there was a place called Elba Woods, most students today look out at the Lake Sagagawea and they think it was always there. And I've done some work in schools and I tell students that where I was raised and went to school is under the water out of, in the lake uh, and they don't believe it. All of those things happened at that time and will never, had never happened before, will probably never happen again because you can't you know, it's a time that's well past. The credit would go to, you know, Sydney and Ike and John and Charlie and Harry and Leon and Harold and Raymond, you know, for an unusual bunch that happened to be together at that particular time in the history of not only, like I say, the, the history of Elba Woods, but the history of North Dakota. They moved from victim to victory. And once you continually have excuses, and, whatever, and the excuses are valid in many cases, what they do is they shackle you for life. And at that moment, they broke from it. There's a spiritual portion to this. You know, this isn't just about a town. It's not just about a few homes and a, a few businesses. It, 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 it's, it's about the spiritual understanding of where you come from, where you grew up, who you are, where you're headed. I mean, that's so... People forget kind of the spiritual connection. And you can put that, you, you can put that whole town underwater, many, many feet of water on top of it. It, it. it can never destroy the spiritual connection people who live there or the ancestors of people who live there and have heard the stories about that. That's spiritual. That's what makes this 42 team more special than just getting on a hardwood floor and playing a game of basketball with what happened and the history and everything else, um, the uniqueness and the, the, the specialness of this, this team and those to follow uh, shouldn't be forgotten. Elbowwoods High School, 1942 State Class B champion.
Funding for Basketball, Water, and the Lost City of Elbow Woods is made possible by the three affiliated tribes, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nations, celebrating our tradition of resilience, strength, and power, and by the members of Prairie Public. To order a DVD copy of Basketball, Water, and the Lost City of Elba Woods, please visit Prairie Public's online store at shopprairiepublic.org or call 1-800-359-6900.